Go ahead. Go ahead. He's uh, Dr. Sleem's great nephew. And he requested that uh, my organization, the ADC, American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, uh, have a one page uh, <laughs> outline of his life. And it turned out to be my assignment. And the more I looked into it, the more stuff turned up. I got interested and continued on my own and subsequently. So that's how I got on it. Uh, now, David Sleem was born Daoud Sleem, Daoud Hassan Sleem, uh, in 1860, in a small village in Mount Lebanon. And uh, this was a province of, of, in the province of Syria in the Ottoman Empire. He was from a prominent Druze family, uh, which was a medieval offshoot of Islam. And he, the region in Mount Lebanon at, at the time was backward, but the family was modern. His father was a physician, as were his brothers. And he followed his brothers to the Syrian Protestant College in Beirut, which was founded by Presbyterian missionaries. And he got a, a, a modern scientific education there. He got a BA in 1879 and a, went to the medical school and got an MD in 1887. The following year, he immigrated to the US to New York City, where he quickly Americanized his name to David, uh, acquired a second medical degree in six months in order to have a US credential, and had a successful medical career in New York City. He ran a hospital, worked at an insane asylum, which was on the site of what is now Columbia University. Uh, served the charitable institutions uh, on the islands of the East River and uh, had a private practice and a home on upper, in upper Manhattan on West 97th Street. Interestingly, he was not involved in the uh, Arab American community, the ethnic community on the lower West Side but instead he plunged directly into middle-class American professional life. And uh, one of the first things he got involved in, strangely enough, was the insurance industry. He became a, a director or a secretary of um, an insurance company run by a fellow named Durlin, who was colorful, but shady turned out to be a con man, uh, and he wound up in prison for uh, sentence for fraud. It's a little strange to understand how uh, Dr. Sleem got involved in it. It seems quite out of character. Perhaps he was duped, but we don't really know exactly. The next thing he got involved in was working on a master's in science in electrical engineering. And electricity, of course, was at the time very much in the air. Uh, homes, streets, offices, factories everywhere were being electrified. And the electrical industry and the internal combustion industry were uh, essentially creating the technology of the 20th century. Uh, Sleem went to uh, Columbian College in Washington, D.C. and got his degree in 1896. Uh, the the Sleem family uh, has a tradition that he invented the electric fan and was an early experimenter in electric railways and factories. I haven't really turned up evidence to validate that, 
but uh, there is a photograph of Dr. Sleem in his graduation gowns, holding a cord and looking at a fan on a table next to him. Uh, I think that's a pretty clear indication that the fan was the product of some of his work uh, at Columbian. And he probably made some innovation on the electric motor or the fan design. And at the graduation, he did deliver a paper uh, on the construction of electric railways. This is very much his concern. In 1897, he became a US citizen. He made his commitment here and was permanent. After 10 years in New York and in the US, he realized he had health problems. Um, he was over 200 pounds, uh, definitely overweight. It was hard to climb stairs. He would pant, his heartbeat was irregular. And he said he had what he called fat around the heart. Uh, what he needed was exercise and hard work. So he moved to the Northwest where there were gold strikes in the Klondike and in British Columbia. He formed a company of five men. And they set out and got as far as Glendora, Glenora. Uh, in British Columbia, a small settlement on the Susquehanna River. He, they and thousands of others were stuck because the trail overland to the gold fields was impassable. The Canadian government had promised a railroad would be built there, but they did not deliver. His friends got discouraged and went home, but Dr. Slame persisted, he opened the sawmill. And after a season of pretty hard work, he said he felt healthy again. Next, he made a winter trek uh, into the, towards the gold fields near Atlin. And there he purchased uh, gold bearing land uh, with funds which were supplied by his brother Assad back in Lebanon. But the uh, British Columbian Parliament passed a law forbidding foreigners from acquiring mining claims or licenses or owning mineral properties. So Dr. Sleem kept going. He went up next to El Dorado Creek in the Hondike, and he was a miner and a physician in Dawson. From there, he went on to Nome. It seems he was following new gold strikes as they emerged, but tended to be rather behind the curve in, when he got there. Finally, after six years of traveling from place to place, he settled more permanently in Seward in 1904. This was on the coast of uh, South Central Alaska on the Kenai Peninsula. And it was founded uh, just the previous year by John and Frank Belaine uh, as a coastal terminus of the Alaska Central Railroad into the interior to the gold fields and the coal fields. The town grew rapidly with stores, a bank, seven saloons, three churches, two hotels, electricity, waterworks, and uh, a chamber of commerce. But the town was still pretty raw. Uh, on Sleem's corner, uh, the intersection of Fourth and Adams, uh, close to the waterfront, he, uh, there were still stumps in the intersection 
which were being cleared out by a couple of Alaska natives who were serving 90 day jail sentences. He opened a medical practice and he was said to have all the most modern methods and his office was possibly the best equipped anywhere in the North. His home was a large, substantial two-story building made of massive logs with large porches across the, both the first and second story. And there was a big American flag waving over the top. He immediately plunged into Seward social life and helped to create it. He opened his home to meetings, uh, dances, religious services. He started a uh, Sunday school in his home and offered uh, lectures in his home in Sunday evenings. He became one of the leaders of the Methodist church, which met in a tent. And he was the initiator of the building of a permanent church uh, building. He organized a choir where he was the first tenor. He, in his home, he held a founding meeting for the Episcopal Church in Seward. So he wasn't a member. Early on, he, uh, the, the Seward Gateway newspaper commented, too much credit cannot be given to Sleem and Lisa, his nephew's wife, for creating a moral influence in providing intellectual entertainments. His lectures were highly interesting and neither residents nor visitors should miss them. The very su successful Sunday school had an influence for good among our young people that cannot be estimated. They concluded saying, these true missionaries have laid a moral foundation for this new town. High praise. Later, he organized a literary and debating club a dramatic club discussing Shakespeare, and um, he, he was uh, one of the town community social leaders. He also opened a business, a transfer company, a horse and wagon, uh, shifting cargo from the docks to warehouses, stores, or wherever. This was uh, a partnership between him and his uh, and Lisa's brother, George Salibi. He became a leader in the Chamber of Commerce and he initiated a reorganization of the chamber that increased the membership and participation. And he initiated and oversaw the building of a sewer in the central business district. Um, somehow the contract for it went to George Salibi his partner and in-law, but quicker than you can say nepotism or conflict of interest, the uh, Salibi had the sewer completed six days ahead of schedule and everybody was happy. And it was important to clean up the town because uh, the main street had been an eyesore for uh, possible settlers and investors and the business community wanted uh, it to look better. But Salim unfortunately, well, Seward unfortunately went into a decline. The, the Alaska Central Railroad uh, had to be reorganized already in 1905 under new management. And in 07, there was a national financial panic that ruined some of its backers. Uh, the railroad went into bankruptcy, receivership, it finally was forced to be sold to, in 1909, to the J.P. Morgan Guggenheim Alaska Syndicate, which was essentially buying up Alaska and taking over its economy. Copper mines, gold mines, coal mines, steamship lines, railroad construction companies, pretty much everything of importance. In the process of all of this, uh, there were intense personal conflicts, lawsuits, and finally congressional hearings. 
uh, the decline that people lost jobs, were unemployed, and a lot of people left Seward. Uh, many went over to Valdez. In response to this condition, the Seward business community formed the Seward Commercial Club to reverse the trend through a um, major publicity campaign. And Sleem was in the very center of all of that. Uh, first, he went to work for the Alaska Central and ran its hospital. And then he became a traveling advocate for Seward and for Alaska. He genuinely believed in Alaska's prospects. And uh, he went on a four month tour of the lower 48, uh, speaking to medical societies, businesses, and other organizations in the Eastern cities. When do you have a break? Um, sorry, I forgot the break. <laughs> Too much momentum. <laughs> So if anybody has comments or questions, I'll, I'll just pause now. Um, Clark, you have a, had a question. It's in your chat. It said, he was under the impression that Sleem spent a short time in Valdez before he settled in Seward. And when he left Seward and moved to Valdez, it was a return to a place he'd been before. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Uh, I don't know anything about what he did in Valdez the first time. And it, I don't think he stayed there very long, but he definitely was there. I have a question. Okay. When did he do the, um, I did a rod map. We'll get to that. Get to that, okay. I'm waiting <laughs> patiently. Are you leading the speaker, Vicki? <laughs> no, I'm, I, I'm just wondering if that's part of the story. <laughs> Well, it's timely because <laughs> the next thing he did was to um, uh, lead an expedition to the Iditarod. The Alaska Northern Railroad, the successor, successor to the Alaska Central, uh, um, enlisted him to lead an expedition uh, that would blaze a trail for a wagon trail and a railroad extension. And so he and 16 other people set out and they uh, identified the most feasible trails through the mountain passes that would be easiest and uh, most direct and uh, the best trail. Sleem was, a, uh, was a, the press spokesman for this as well. Uh, in his press statement, it, it sounds very much like a release from the uh, Seward Chamber of Commerce, in which it clearly made the argument that the trail from Seward to uh, Iditarod, uh, the gold fields, was the most feasible. Seward at the time was competing with Valdez and Cordova uh, to be the major rail uh, railway into the interior. But he did also make the map. <laughs> Getting to that. Okay. In, in addition to uh, speaking, uh, he also wrote a lot of articles uh, for the commercial club and which were published in the Atlanta, Alaska, Yukon Magazine, uh, promoting Alaska, promoting Seward. Uh, and he made a series of maps, which uh, were, which gave a very precise and accurate and a more accurate picture of Alaska than the pre than previous maps. I think he picked up some of those skills when he was at Columbia University, which had uh, curriculum that had topography and surveying and mineralogy and so forth. Um, skills that he later put to use in Alaska. Um, the map of Ardetarod uh, in particular 
uh, featured the trail the, that he blazed uh, and that the railroad later uh, began to follow. And these maps, the purpose of these maps comes through pr pretty clearly in, in the sense of uh, the ads on them were all from Seattle or Seward businesses. Uh, railroad hotels, uh, outfitters, and uh, sewage businesses in general, and Seattle businesses. They were aimed at prospectors and were popular and useful for uh, a couple of decades. But behind uh, Sleem's uh, enthusiasm for Seward, he must have had some misgivings because the problems there were pretty obvious. And uh, we can see th this came to the surface um, in the, the end of 1910. On December 9th, he spoke to a large and enthusiastic commercial club gathering at the Seward uh, YMCA and talking about Adetarad, the trail, and the prospects for, for uh, the mines there showed stereoscopic slides of settlement and the mining operations. But the next day, he left on the steamship for Valdez. He promised to be splitting his time between the two cities, but the move was permanent. Um, Valdez, unlike Seward, at this time was experiencing a boom. Um, there were gold strikes. The cliff mine had uh, been opened up in 1906 and started producing gold in large quantities in the spring of 1910. Um, in one day, it produced $13,000 worth of ore, and in three years, $670,000. $70,000 worth. Prospectors and investors rushed in and Sleem was one of the people uh, rushing in. Already previously in March, 1910, Sleem was in New York. Uh, he was selling his shares in an Egyptian bank that his brother had given him in order to invest in mines. Uh, for him, it was urgent. And three days later, he was off to Valdez and he bought 900 shares in the cliff mine. And, sh and he sh had shares or was co owner of nine other mines and mining plants. He was said to be an enthusiast for mining. In his medical practice, which he picked up there, uh, he was associated with the Episcopal uh, Hospital of the Good Shepherd. Now, in his contract, uh, what was specified was that the hospital and Slim both would uh, get contracts from mining companies to handle their patients, uh, illnesses and accidents and whatever. Uh, the hospital would provide supplies, board and nursing while Slim would be physician and surgeon. The split would be 60-40, the hospital got the 60. Slim himself was uh, overweight still, or again. There was a baseball game, uh, which was held as a fundraiser in which the community leaders would play each other. Uh, it was a, game between the fats and the leans, and Slim was one of the fats. He was over 200 pounds. He did not join the Episcopal Church, though. Um, well, he was a good friend. Well, I'm sorry, he did join the Episcopal Church, and he was a good friend of the Reverend Ziegler there. Uh, he also joined uh, several fraternal organizations, the Odd Fellows, the Eagles, the Pioneers of Alaska, and the Alaska Brotherhood. And he was an active member of, the, of these organizations, helped organize events, and he served as Arctic chief for the Brotherhood for 
several months. His primary achievement in Valdez, in my judgment, was the development of a, of a major public health campaign in which he mobilized the city council, the newspapers and ladies organizations, as well as the general public to clean up the town. Uh, this was a, in order to combat infectious diseases. And, and in doing this, he was elected a public health officer in 1912 and 1913. Disease was a very serious concern to both uh, officials and the public at this time. The bacteriological origin of disease was still fairly uh, a new, fairly new discovery and uh, national, territorial and local officials were uh, very active in uh, conducting studies, passing laws, warning the public and uh, committing funds to combat disease. So, Slim published uh, many public announcements uh, alerting the public to the problem and advising them on how to prevent the spread of disease, uh, which had already created epidemics in the Yukon and in uh, Alaska native villages. In Valdez, the streets, alleys, streams were filthy. They were used to dump trash, garbage, kitchen slops. There were filthy outhouses, cesspools, and piles of manure used for fertilizer around town. The city council ordered a cleanup day. Uh, citizens were urged to clean their property, their yards and sidewalks, and the city would clean the streets. And Slim published detailed and graphic instructions um, on how to clean, what chemicals to use for household sanitation. He also declared a war against flies as spreaders of disease. There was a monetary prize and he was aiming this at children mostly. Uh, the winner was a 10 or 11 year old girl who racked up an astounding body count of 13,400 flies. Uh, I hope she remembered to wash her hands <laughs> after counting the flies. Um, he also uh, urged the city council to build a sewer uh, uh, to drain a block of McKinley Street that was especially unsanitary, but it was only when uh, Mrs. Fred Cameron, whose th three month old daughter had died of spinal meningitis, appealed to the council that they took effective action and the sewer was built. The public was also less than fully cooperative. In one of Sleem's articles, uh, he says, the power of a health officer is limited without the cooperation of a rational public. And we can sense his frustration and anger at an unmindful community, untrained in scientific observation that continued in its habits, heedless of warnings from community leaders based on the most advanced scientific research. Sounds familiar. So in the summer of 1913, Seward experienced its worst epidemic, whooping cough, pertussis. Other Alaska towns had scarlet fever, diphtheria, or mumps, but Valdez had chicken pox, which across the US killed 10,000 children every year. In Valdez, all the children were sick, or many bedridden, one died, many adults were sick. 
So Sleem put one neighborhood under quarantine, he fumigated the Orpheum Theater, and he acquired a brand new vaccine, probably from his medical acquaintances in New York, and uh, offered it to the public. But it was premature, and the vaccine turned out to be ineffective, and the disease ran its course. And there were more things that Sleem got involved in. Um, as I said, Valdez was competing with Seward and Cordoba. And the, uh, the issue was the uh, railroad out to the Matanuska coal fields. The Chamber of Commerce held an enthusiastic mass meeting, but Valdez was full of people who had lived in Seward, still had friends there and had divided loyalties. And so the resolution to Congress that the meeting came up with tried to be non-competitive in spirit. It argued for Valdez as the best um, locus for the railroad, but it said that each city had an equal right to, um, to attempt to be the terminus of the railroad, but whatever city was chosen, uh, and the development of Alaska's interior would benefit everyone. And it went on to say that the decision should be made by army engineers who would decide on the basis of the most feasible, shortest and practical route with the least cost for construction, maintenance and operation. Uh, this attempt to take the high ground, uh, the moral high ground would have been a little more persuasive if army surveyors, army uh, surveyors had not already uh, decided that Valdez was the best location. Tom Eric. Do you, do you wanna give people a chance to ask questions again or are you? Yeah, we have so lots of questions. So can we take a minute to answer some of these? Sure. Okay, so, Matt Kinney asked, do you have the names of other doctors in Valdez at the same time that Sleen was practicing? I do, but not in front of me. Okay. Um, but, but Matt- um, He has your his, email. Um, um, Marvin's contact information is in um, the chat. And that is at, let's see. Marvick, M-A-R-V-I-C-K-2 at Comcast.net. And if you email him, I, I think he can give that to you. What? Um, I have another person, um, Clark, is asking, um, will you say Dr. Sleem was over 200 pounds? How tall was he? I don't know. Approximately even? <laughs> I don't know. Okay, I'm going to... Uh, just share my screen for two seconds and show you a picture of him with, I don't know if that helps you. This is where he's a much younger man. Is that correct, Marvin? Can you see uh, that photograph this, of- this, this, I think, was uh, 1890, um, 1896. Okay. And it's probably pretty hard with those robes to tell just how- um, what his physique is, but this gives you an idea of what he's like as a young man. That was his graduation picture. Mm -hmm. um, is there a newspaper article available about the fly eradication campaign? Yes, several. Okay, so Clark, I would get in touch with uh, Marvin to get that information, okay? Let's sure. see. And if anybody doesn't want me to read their question and just wants to unmute themselves, you feel free to go for it. I'm, I'm good with that. Um, Garrett Verbeek had a question about the railroad. Was the Alaska Northern Railroad expedition the same with Alfred Lowell and Jerhiro Weda or a different one? Uh, a different one. Uh, the, the one you mentioned came first. It was also sponsored, I think, by the Seward Commercial Club. Uh, and Slames was a follow-up. Okay. 
Thank you. It, did that answer? Do you want, have any more questions for him? I mean, I think we all have more questions, but we'll let him move on. I've got a couple more. It said here, um, in what way was Sleem related to Teamster George and Seward? And this is from Clark. Um, Sleem's nephew, Naseeb in Seattle, uh, was married to Lisa Salibi, and George Salibi was her brother. What can you tell us about Sleem's wife, Lillian? Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> I'll read you from the um, the Gateway article in this paper. Uh, this was 1904. Mrs. Grace Lillian Kecklenburg celebrated her birthday at Sleem Hall. Sleem let off the musical portion of the evening with the new sentimental ballad. I'm wearing my heart away for you. Um, Mrs. Tecklenburg also sang a solo which was warmly received and people wanted encores. There were, there were violin and piano duets followed by recitations and a grand march led by Mr. and Mrs. Tecklenburg. There was dancing until midnight when the celebration moved to the Tecklenburg residence for a late dinner with lovely china, silver, cut glass, and ferns. The next edition of the Gateway told us readers that the party was one of the most successful social affairs ever given in our progressive cities. A few days later, Ms. Tecklenburg left by steamship to spend the winter in Seattle. Uh, due to the ship's early departure, she missed the farewell dinner organized by her friends from the Wednesday evening whist club. Sometime during the following year or two, Mrs. Tecklenburg became Mrs. Sleem. And she was uh, born in Illinois of German American parents, uh, and they moved to Seattle. Her father was a carpenter, a brother, a bartender. She had an early marriage uh, that ended quickly. She then later married uh, Mr. Tecklenburg, who owned a saloon uh, in Washington State, and they moved to Seward. Her, her name was Grace Lillian. Uh, she was initially known as Grace, but after her marriage to Dr. Sleem, he preferred to call her Lillian. They were rather different people. He was about 20 years older. Uh, they were, they had different ethnicities, religious backgrounds from different social classes, and she couldn't begin to match his four university degrees. So uh, the marriage did not succeed and didn't endure. By 1911, she was, well, by 1910, she seems to be uh, living with, back with her parents in Seattle. And in 1911, she was living in St. Louis and she remarried to another doctor. Uh, so in a nutshell, I can give her. Um, um, I have um, a question um, to, to me that says, um, this is from Isam Slim, and it just said, would you share with us the link of the recorded session? So um, what I will do after this session is recorded is I will put this out on YouTube. So if you um, leave your contact information, um, I can um, give you the link to YouTube or you can simply go out there and I'll have a, a title that makes sense about Dr. Sleen. The other option is you can always email me at um, educator at valdezmuseum.org and I will get you the link. Let's see if there are any more questions here. Um, 
so many family members of Dr. Sleem. This is absolutely wonderful. Um, so many family members of Dr. Sleem. Yes, here. Um, I just wanted to say something to Beverly. Um, Bev, you know, have you've traveled out to the Pioneer Cemetery and have you noticed um, that there are many people who passed away in that period from around 1911 to 1913? Have you ever noted that? You'd have to unmute yourself. Um, I haven't noticed that. Do, do you mean the cemetery that's out there past the ball field? Yeah, yeah. And I was just wondering mm -hmm. if this, um, any of the um, diseases or illnesses that um, Marvin is speaking about, that Dr. Sleem may have pay, played a role in um, trying to mitigate, um, were impacting those people who passed away and that are present in the cemetery. I think there are records. I'm almost positive I have records of who died of what out there, um, but I don't recall. But you don't know? I haven't noticed that. No, it's been a few years since I've been out there. Okay, well, yeah, I was just out there a couple of days ago. So um, you brought that to mind. Does anyone else have a question for Marvin before he um, returns to talking? And if so, you, you're welcome to unmute yourself and just pose it or write in the chat. Okay, um, I, we're back on. I'm going to shift back to you, Marvin. Okay, uh, in response to the question about doctors in Valdez, um, I do, in my larger manuscript, I do have a couple of pages on doctors. That was a uh, Dr. Andreas von Gunther, uh, Dr. E.C. Dalton, uh, Dr. Frank M. Boyle, who uh, was also elected mayor, and a Dr. Louis Camisho. So if, you, if you're interested, I could uh, email you these pages, which has some detail on, on each of them. There were other doctors, but these are the ones I, I found the most information on. So, Sleem uh, didn't stop there with all these activities. He, uh, in his last days, he, he also became a banker, a vice president, a director, and an investor. He and others started the Prince William Fish Company and planned to build a cannery. And in 1913, the governor of the territory pointed him to the Board of Medical Examiners, which uh, reviewed the credentials of doctors in uh, Alaska uh, and, their, and, and determined their skills and knowledge base. Uh, because in the past, there had been some people who were passing themselves off as bogus doctors. In, uh, in the spring of 1913, uh, he wrote to another nephew in Seattle. He said, I shall not be able to go east for some time to come yet. I have great work to do in this country before I leave it. I must reap the fruits of my staying here for so long a time. And it is not very far off before we have more activity in every line of business. The industry of the country is mining. It's a new country and a hard one to live in. We have begun to be in part a self-governing people. And for the first time in the history of the country, we have a legislature to make laws for ourselves. Alaska became a territory in 1912. And in this letter, we can feel something of the hope and ambition he had both for himself and for his adopted country. But the heart trouble he had caught up with him. In the fall of 1913, he was on a hunting trip down the bay, probably in his motor launch, the Nebula, 
uh, when he experienced intense chest pains. He returned home, spent a week in the Good Samaritan Hospital, seemed better, uh, went back to work, started seeing patients. But on October the 11th, as a patient entered his office, uh, he came out to greet her, but collapsed and died. He was 53 years old. Word of mouth spread the news around the town. The family was notified. Uh, there were obituaries in newspapers all across Alaska because he was known pretty much everywhere. The family in Mount Lebanon, when they got the word, held a memorial service, which some 5,000 people attended. The funeral in Valdez was overflowing. Businesses and schools closed. All the fraternal orders uh, had their members attend. Uh, and Valdez dignitaries and leading citizens were there. The odd fellows handled the arrangements and Reverend Ziegler presided. And Reverend Ziegler testified that he interested himself as no one else has in our work here. By word and work and gift, he inspired and helped me and advised me. The last Sunday of his life, he worshiped in our little church. And he added a personal note, I must lay bare my soul, for Valdez gave me no other so good a friend. The Valdez Prospector newspaper commented, Sleem counted the entire population of Seward among his friends. The death of no one else in Valdez could have affected so many people as did the death of Dr. Sleem. His body was shipped to his family in Seattle and in his memory, Valdez built a free library and reading room for working men. Uh, which is meant to be an alternative to the bar room or place of recreation. This had been one of Dr. Sleem's projects. The administration on his estate lasted for years until at least 1921. It turned out that his debts exceeded his assets. 172 people or more owed him money and most of it was uncollectible. His mining stocks mostly had no value. The cliff mine became flooded with seawater and shut down. And it had been the most productive. And there were many financial claims on his estate by people he owed money to. Finally, in 1921, the heirs of his brother Assad uh, received repayment of loans uh, amounting to something over $1,000. And in summary, I think we can say the sleeve it had come a long way from the mountains of Lebanon to the sophisticated circles of New York to the frontier town of Alaska. It was a, a life that was marked by frequent breaks and new beginnings. Um, he was clearly an intelligent, ambitious, enterprising man, open to new ideas and new experiences. He was committed to public service and a, had a strong civic conscience and was a, a very active citizen. And LDC in Seward, he made improvements in public health and probably saved a good many lives. And he contributed significantly to Seward's and Valdez's transition from boom towns to subtle communities. on a rude and often lawless frontier, not conducive to reflective intellectual activities, Sleem was among those exerting a quote unquote, civilizing influence on community life. He was a modernizer and a progressive reformer committed to medicine, science and education and dedicated to humane values. And I'd say his life in the US uh, it's a good case study of an immigrant's successful cultural assimilation. He threw in his lot with America. He plunged into the mainstream middle class and had little connection with the Arab American community except to his family. 
In the end, however, we can say that his life was not unlike those of his family members back home, who were also modernizers and leaders in the humane professions. They were physicians, uh, medical missionaries, and educators. They brought modern medicine and science to the people of Syria, Lebanon, and Palestine. So uh, that's what I have. Thank you, that was wonderful. You know, you have just, um, for me, um, giving me a whole new perspective on Valdez. Um, and I just, I thank you so much for really um, bringing to light in life someone that we all need to know about. Um, wow. I'm gonna unmute everyone I'm, and I'm going to attempt to. <laughs> Uh, ask all to unmute and if you have questions or comments for Marvin, please feel free to chime in. Thank you. So many of you, some of you are, to, are in Europe and it's two or three o'clock in the morning and you're joining us. Thank you. How many people are on? 23, we had 23 people. Does anyone have a question, comment? Yeah, that's me in Europe. Uh, this is Hatem Slim. I, I have a question. Uh, I, I thank you for your effort and all what you've done, the whole organization, and uh, also personally the work you have done. Uh, did you come up with any ideas as to what should should be done to kind of gather all that documentation about him and maybe have it in one place, maybe something to commemorate his life and his contributions? Uh, good question. The, uh, what I presented was a boiled down version of an article I've written that will be published in the next book by the Arab American historian, uh, Linda Jacobs. Uh, Linda had already written about Dr. Sleem in her first two books briefly, and uh, I sent her what I had written uh, about him, and she wanted uh, a shorter version as an article for her book. And uh, I do have a larger manuscript of about 106 pages now that i uh, not quite sure what to do with. I don't think it has commercial pros prospects. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I would like to make it available to libraries and historical associations and to interested people. Yeah, that would be great. I mean, if we can uh, do something, especially in his hometown, uh, if we can gather, because they don't know much about him and that part of history is kind of forgotten for for us so it would be nice to get to know our ancestors and their contributions oh i certainly could send what i've written to to the town uh, do you have any suggestions beyond that uh, they dr Slim made a lot of maps and copies of the maps could be put up in you know the town library or the town hall or whatever yeah, I would say any documentation that's available can be, mm -hmm. maybe we could have some something like a museum or a part of a museum where we can save this documentation. Because he's not the only one from the family who, who contributed greatly to history, I would say. That's true, uh, very true. So. Atem, could you please share uh, what was his hometown? The name is Jbeah. Uh, it's in Mount Lebanon uh, and the, the area called El Shouf. So it's Jbeah El Shouf in Mount Lebanon. So what you could say. Is it in Lebanon? Sorry? I, I asked what country it's in now, because I know it's sometimes it's been in Syria and sometimes it's been in Lebanon. No, no. <laughs> I just wanted yeah, it's to know in where Lebanon. it is now. 
And now it's Jbea El Shouf in Mount Lebanon. It's in Lebanon. <laughs> yeah, if I may add. It's a great town. Maybe maybe you'll come visit us one day and we'll show you the town. Any of you is interested in visiting us, we'll welcome you. It's very uh, uh, generous, very receiving, uh, very open and friendly town. That would be exciting. Sure. <laughs> You'll be my guest. <laughs> wow. Oh, how wonderful. Shukran. 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 Ahlan wa sahlan. Someone was, um, uh, was it Lourdes? So someone had a question or comment? Uh, this is Matt, I have a question, can you hear okay. me? Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, a very good presentation. Um, have you used ORTH uh, Alaska place names and dictionary as a source of information? Um, I, I perused it and I see that Mr. Salim's uh, map of 1910 is referenced throughout that dictionary of Alaska place names. And um, so that, that he, he definitely had an impact. His map is referenced throughout that, that book. Um, and then a quick look at references, a, a Sleem Creek near, up in the Yukon somewhere. And so if you have a chance to look at ORTHS, O-R-T-H-S, it's a really good research uh, document for names and there's all sorts of connections you can you can draw. Uh, thank you. I, I did uh, see the reference to Sleem's Creek. Uh, I believe that was named uh, after his nephew uh, Rashid, uh, who, who went out to the Northwest shortly before uh, Dr. Sleem, and who pretty quickly was involved in mining and um, owning claims and so forth. And because he was a, uh, yeah, just... a mine owner, uh, his name was used to name geographic locations. Yeah, yeah. Just to, um, to add to this, just a little bit, just from my perspective, is uh, you know, doctors. Uh, in Valdez have been, have been honored. I mentioned in the side, Kamisha Glacier, uh, Benet Peak, uh, we have Embeck Peak. And unfortunately we seem to have missed Mr. Salim when we were naming prominent peaks and, and things around Valdez. Uh, people really honored doctors back then with, with place names. They were really highly respected. So that's my final comments. Thanks for the presentation. Thank you. Marvin, if, if we have documents which are kind of harder to come by, which you may not have seen before, would you be interested in them? Absolutely. And the ones, so the ones that I'm thinking of specifically are a, a 1907 map by Sleem that doesn't seem to be very well known. And then he also had a series of claims on the Kenai Peninsula with um, kind of Arab or Ottoman themes. So there's the Shah, the Harim, the Khedive, the Emir, the Pasha, the Sultan, the Prophets, and the Mandarin which were all staked by him along with uh, Mr. Malawi, or Salawi, sorry, and some others. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand. Hold on a second. Uh, he, he said that there are a number of claims and he has the records of that. Mining claims. Mining claims that yes. have Arab mm. names. Ah, and which, which were staked by Slim and his relatives. Right. Ah. And would you be interested in knowing? Yes, that? I don't think I've seen those. Um, Jinan, did you have something you were um, going to say? Um, uh, not really, but when, uh, um, what's the, Hatem? Yeah, it mentioned about yes. Ijba, et cetera. Yeah, hello. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, even then, we are talking about Lebanon. We're not talking about Syria. It was then even mm. in the heart of Lebanon, in the Mount of Lebanon. So uh, this mix with Syria and Lebanon, you know, just uh, is something a little bit um, uh, 
you know, caught my attention. And uh, if I may just, just add a couple of things to, to, to make a little linkage with him and Lebanon in that sense. Uh, my mother was seven years old when he died. And um, uh, thank you so much, Marvin, for all this information. I mean, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. And I took some notes and uh, I, I'm delighted to hear all uh, the details and whatnot. I have read a couple of things, but this kind of completed the picture for me. Uh, so you mentioned there were several thousand people at the funeral or the, uh, they put a picture of him. That's I, I know from my mother's memoir. They put a picture of him because they, there was no body in a coffin. <laughs> And uh, really about 20 villages were invited. So, I mean, uh, that, that's the custom. They announce the death of so-and-so. And then he was very, very loved and very well known, very much so. Oh. And uh, his uh, uh, and my mother, because she was seven, she was little, they went up on the roof, uh, on the roof just to see all these crowds of people. It was a very hot day, October, yes, but we could have a lot of hot days in October uh, there. So uh, people were in the heat and they were just drinking lemonade, uh, which was not the habit. The habit, the custom was to only offer pure refreshing water. And um, anyway, uh, so um, his sister uh, had um, a huge amount of uh, uh, lemonade prepared in, in those uh, jars, terracotta jars, and people were, because there were so many of them. Well, of course, uh, uh, his, his, what I wanted to say, uh, people loved him dearly uh, because of what they knew about him. And of course, because the relationship between him and his brother, who is my grandpa, my grandfather, was very, very strong. Actually, they kind of went back and forth before his decision to go to the States. And then finally, he convinced him that he needs to leave. He felt, I don't know, he was called to leave. Uh, let's remember that the year he was born in 1860 was a year of immense, huge uh, war in the area between Druze and Christians. And it was, he was born actually um, about a month after or before the start of the war. So they were very, very unusual times in the country at the time when he was born. So uh, my um, grandfather is also a physician uh, and um, graduated also from what became the American University later, uh, but the same one that um, Dr. Seam went to. And, and so um, he was uh, also a forensic doctor. He worked for the government, but then he had some health issues and decided to retire one year before his brother uh, 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 was, um, uh, before, um, sorry, uh, before Dr. Seem died. So it was just that year when he went back to Jba, he was in, in, in the other central city, Muqtada. He moved to Jba and settled there, um, continued on to practice medicine, and then they heard the news and uh, about his passing, et cetera. So anyway, it, 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 it was, he was very well known, very much loved, and uh, uh, his uh, achievements there in the U.S. Uh, were uh, uh, shared, and uh, so um, people quite, you know, loved him and respected him very much there. Like, he wasn't totally detached from the country, you know, they kept the ties all the time. Yes. Yeah, over all these years, they kept very, very strong ties. Yeah. And just an add on <laughs> about his personal. <laughs> Sounds like you're somebody. Yes, you know, good uh, Alan interview. His, his immediate family, uh, the, the, you know, his brothers, and they, they were all like the founders of, of the area in terms of like doctors and highly educated and leaders. 
mm-hmm. even military leaders in the in the Syrian revolution. There, there were, uh, you know, one of the highest educated and leaders in the area. So they were very well known. That that will add to the fact that you know people come and. To, you know, to their funeral and so forth, because their 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 whole family is well known, and actually the Slim family, one of the founders in in the area in the Shuf Mountains, so it's it's well known uh, family out there. But we we don't have information. I mean, I got the, the information on this invite. Uh, by chance, so I really don't have uh, information uh, or connection uh, with you, Marvin, or or any of the organizers. So I left my email in the chat, uh, hatim.slimatyahu.com. I would appreciate it if you have any information or at least contact so we can follow up later if we have uh, that would a request be for... I'd like to do that. And yes. Hatem, it is in the chat. And also, um, if you go to the very top of the chat, you can have um, Marvin's um, email address is there also. But we'll make sure that okay. you connect. Thank you. Thank you're you. Welcome. Appreciate it. You're, you're welcome. Um, someone, okay, I'll share Marvin's email again. Um, let's see if I got this right. I think it's Marvic too, isn't that Comcast? That's correct. Okay, right, here we go. It's I'm typing it. Yeah, I don't see it on the top of the net. chat. Is that right? Uh, let's see. Marvic two at Com. Okay. Tim, I just added it um, again. Do you see it? Not, not yet. Okay. Faith, are you are you typing to everyone on the chat or to an individual? I hope I'm typing to everyone. To waiting room participants. Did you get it, Beth? Okay. Let me try this again. Okay, okay, here we go. Try this. Thanks for the prompt. Now, can you see it? Uh, it's there. Now, now. now we, it's there now now. we see it. Um, and this is me. Okay. That's me. Um, and the person that Marvin mentioned before is Linda Jacobs. And her new book will have a chapter on Sleem in it. And she's the author of, and Marvin, remind me what the, the names of her two books are. One is called Strangers in the West. I think it came out in 2015. And their subsequent book was Strangers No More. Strangers um, what? No more. Linda Jacobs. So I just put those in the chat also. I know they're available on Amazon. I tried typing your link in and it just was a lot of, well, this is, this is the best way to get them to where they want to go. Um, um, as part of the recording, the chat is saved also. So if anyone needed me to forward that chat to them, I can do that also. Yeah, I'm sure there were a lot of people interested in listening to this presentation, but the time is uh, like it's in the, in the morning, 4 or 5 a.m. in Lebanon. Okay. So they weren't able to. It shouldn't take me too long to um, just go through the recording and um, 
if I have to do any tiny edits and then put it out on YouTube so you would have access to it very shortly. That will be great. And I'll distribute it to the family in Lebanon. Okay. Thank you very much, Faith. Does anyone else have a question for Marvin? Marvin, I just have a question for you in that. Is, are there, you don't need to name all of them. You've been working on this for four decades. Um, <laughs> Are there um, resources or archives where a mm -hmm. lot of this information is available? She wanted to know if there are resources or archives where a lot of this is available. Huh. Valdez. Well, <laughs> uh, and Seward. Okay. I got some materials from the um, Historical Society, Resurrection Bay Historical Society. Okay. Uh, so here... otherwise, uh, it's all over the place. You know, it, it, part of the appeal of doing this research was the detective work of unearthing little fragments of information mm -hmm. off the internet in long forgotten books and magazines and such. It's, it, it's material that would have been impossible to find without the internet. And, and he was living in Washington, D.C. for a while, which Marvin didn't really talk about, but there's some information on his time there as well. That's where he went to the Columbian College. Am I still on audio? Okay. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Uh -huh. uh, I would presume that in various archives and libraries and so forth uh, in the cities where Sleem lived, uh, that would be, you know, still more information buried. For example, um, we contacted AUB and they came up with a little, but I suspect there might be more material there on what was happening at the Syrian Protestant College at the time that was not convenient to dig out without a lot of research and work and time. Mm -hmm. For Alaskan people, they don't know what AUB is, maybe? Oh, uh, the uh, American University of Beirut. Uh, and also it's time in New York, the, the institutions of the New York medical community might have something. The hospital he worked in, the insane asylum, what that, whatever there might be of documents in their archives. And then possibly in Atlin and in Dawson, about, you know, places I, I just couldn't come up with much. There might be something known. Uh, in Valdez, if there are any records from the mining companies where he was a co-owner or had stock, if anything like that exists. Chamber of Commerce records, Seward of LDs. Any of the institutions he was associated with, the fraternal organizations, there might be detailed information about you know, what, he, what he was doing there. I have put um, Karen Oberg. Oh, She's yes. She's a curator of um, exhibits and collections at the Valdez Museum. I put her information. Um, you can just contact her at curator at valdezmuseum.org. Um, if you wanted to know more about um, the collections at the Valdez Museum, um, or you could go to valdezmuseum.org, our website, and um, go on to the collections and do a search that way also. But I put that information in the chat and I presumed a little and just wrote Carol Hatch's um, contact at Resurrection Bay Historical Society in the chat. So um, that might be another way to get at some information. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. If you don't have any more um, questions, and uh, Marvin, you don't have any questions. I, I have one uh, request. Uh, it sounds like the family members 
of Dr. Slaim have uh, recollections and family traditions that it would be good for me to, uh, to, to hear about in more detail. And I'd like to uh, have the opportunity in some way to tap into that. If you could, I don't know, write up what you have or we could have email exchange or whatever, uh, I'd like to do that. I want to thank you. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure I understood your request, uh, Marvin. What, what what information? Well, your own family memories of Dr. Slane. Uh, you know, for example, the description of the, the funeral or the memorial service in the village, uh, things like that. Yeah, that's the first time I, I hear, uh, you know, tonight about them. So I don't think it's documented anywhere or it could be individually with some family members. So there is no, no organized uh, collection as uh, such. And that's why I was asking your opinion or, how to do that. Family oral tradition is also something um, that should be con included. Uh, sorry, uh, I what I mentioned was just from my ma mother's memoir. Uh -huh. So this is the only I, I got this page from her memoir, uh, describing the funeral and her feelings, how much everybody was crying, and the you know anyway, <laughs> uh, and uh, what went on, and uh, uh, how her own mother, uh, even uh, that picture of him she put it on uh they kind of framed it and then she embroidered with her own hands a lot around that picture and it, it looked just fabulous uh although she never knew him because when she got married to his brother my grandfather that was after he left right. so uh she, she never knew him but uh, but they knew so much about him because of this very close relationship with his brother and uh, and of course uh, following his news and everything uh, that they they loved him and that's how it is there it's a different uh, it's a different um, um, I mean people are emotional much more and they connect a lot and so <laughs> they kind of uh, uh, it, it's not strange that even if you don't know that person you almost know him from all what you hear uh yeah there are strong uh, family connections very strong very strong so yeah. i don't know about other important or uh details or information that i can offer myself uh, that's the only thing I, I i found as i said from my mother's memoir uh, but I can I can check with uh, uh, some other you know other cousins of mine and okay. see whatever they have and if there is anything I have your email. Okay, let's correspond about it. I'd like to see that those pages from the memoir. Uh, well, I can I can translate a paragraph and send it to you from Arabic to English. Very yeah, good. I can see yeah. that section of my article expanding a little. Yeah. I, I could do that. Yeah, it's it's their own words, but um, yeah, okay, yeah. I can and the do that. manuscript, as it evolves, has will be forwarded to the Valdez Museum and the Seward Museum if they're interested in it. So it, you know, it, it, it the the there is a copy there now, but it's grown and it continues to grow. So um, that link will continue. Right. Right. Thank, Thank you, you uh, Thank Marvin, Faith, and everyone. Thank Good you, night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Um, Good night. What a wonderful evening. Um, and I'm so happy to have been a part of it. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Faith. Thank you. OK. Hi.
Ecco. Marvin, thank you. Grace, do you know who, who the folks were on the session? On the chat? Yeah. Yeah, I have them all in the chat with their contact information and I can I can get that for you. I'll okay. save the chat and probably just send you the chat with everything in it. Do you know who those who those people were though? I mean, were the Valdez people that you that you recognized or Seward people or um, there were um, people from Valdez. There were people from Seward and the Resurrection Bay that I are new to me. Um, there were people who used to be in Valdez, like Matt Kinney. Um, and then there were members of the Sleem family. Um, I'm looking here. Um, I don't know, Garrett Verbeek is... I'm located in uh, Palmer. Okay, Palmer. Okay, and he's part of the Mountaineering Club of Alaska. Um, Garrett, how did you find out about the talk, just out of curiosity? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, so by pure coincidence, that 1907 map I uh, had found just a few days ago. I sent that around to a few historical societies because many people have seen Sleem's three 1910 maps. Uh, there's the map of central Alaska, the map of the Willow Creek Mining District, and the map of the uh, Kenai Peninsula and Moose Pass Mining Districts. And those are very well known, but to the best of my knowledge, uh, not many people have seen that 1907 map. I've never seen it referenced or printed. So a few days ago, I sent an email to uh, some folks in different historical societies, uh, just kind of sharing it and saying, hey, apologies if people have seen it before, but I never have. So here it is. Um, and someone wrote back, I think it was um, maybe Sherry Hamming of the Palmer Historical Society. I forget. But someone wrote back and said, well, you know, in a couple days, they'll be talking about this. And oh, wow. sent me a link. So I'm oh, very appreciative. Awesome. And that was uh, a nice coincidence. Thank you. I did see a... Uh, that, that uh, map you're referencing, I got it from uh, Colleen Miyoki in Seward. Yes, yeah. within the last few days or more recent or previously. She, it was new to me as well. Ah. Uh, do you know who has the copyright on that? Uh, I believe so. Anything prior to 1925 is in public domain. Really? And the map itself is hosted at the Library of Congress digital collection. Ah. Um, but my personal interest is uh, I'm working on a project to track down the origin stories behind geographic place names in Alaska. Mm -hmm. And as a result, I trawl through a whole bunch of information, especially on mining claims, because uh, those prospectors were frequently the ones to name creeks. Did you, did you uh, get the full story on the Slim Creek and its background? Uh, so I looked it up. Um, and I don't know the full story of that. Uh, my area of interest is south of the Alaska range. Um, but I did note, uh, I guess the notes in Orth's dictionary or in um, the current federal database is called the, um, the GNIS. And that says that it was named in 1898, right. which would fit with your information that it was a relative because I believe that was prior to, uh, to Dawood's arrival in uh, in Alaska. That's right, yes. But anyway, I'll leave you to it. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, and I will uh, send you an email shortly, but thank you so much for all of this information. That's incredible, huge right. amount of research. Yeah. Thanks, Garrett. Thanks for sharing and um, adding to all these wonderful resources. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna stop recording and let's see here. Maybe.